All right, so what I'd like to do, excuse me, is just talk a little bit more about the hierarchy of scientific evidence. Uh, here it is. And obviously it's going from, whoops, I need my pen. It's going from uh, stronger types of scientific evidence to weaker types of scientific evidence. And I got this hierarchy, and you know, it's a pretty standard hierarchy that we have in you know sciences uh, from a website about you know medicine. And so, it's probably worth my while to talk about how talk about a little bit more how these different levels translate into psychology and psychological research. And so what I'd like to do is go through each of the levels and give you examples of studies in these levels. So the lowest level, case reports, opinion papers, and letters. And uh, so this is the lowest level of scientific evidence. It's interesting, but it really isn't from an experiment or any type of serious study. Uh, so case reports, here's from internal medicine, a case report. Iron deficiency anemia caused by proton pump inhibitors. A, so they're talking about one 69-year-old guy was given a drug and developed anemia. And so this is just a case report on what happened. And that's it. They just describe one example of something happened. And, uh, you know, that's about it. Uh, there's no controls. There's, you know, no ability to generalize. It's just a case report. Interesting, but nothing nearly interesting as a controlled study or, or trustworthy as a controlled study. Uh, as an example of something from this level uh, in psychology, uh, there's this article that I just love. Uh, it's uh, from 2004 and it's about Stanley Milgram. Uh, he asked his graduate students when he was teaching at New York University uh, to board a crowded train, a uh, subway train, and ask, them, uh, ask people for their seat. Just, excuse me, I need to sit down. Could I have your seat? And surprisingly, 68% of the people asked gave up their seat, stood up so somebody could just sit down. Uh, and it's a newspaper article and they interview the uh, graduate students who did it and you notice that they're interviewing people based on their memory of what happened. So again, a case study uh, reporting about one simple case, uh, you know, 35 years after the fact, uh, you know, so not really that trustworthy in terms of science, but it is certainly interesting. Uh, the next up level, animal trials and in vitro studies. So this table comes from medicine, and uh, the reason why animal trials are at this level is the issue of external validity. Uh, that is, animals are not people, and so when you do a study uh, of medicine on animals, it's difficult to generalize to humans. And the same rules about external validity apply to medicine as they do psychology. So without a study with people in it, you can't confidently generalize to people. So that's why this level is so low, uh, because the issues of external validity, you can't generalize to human beings. Uh, they probably did a randomized controlled experiment at this level, but they just can't generalize to people because of external validity. In vitro studies mean in glass or a test tube study. And, you know, uh, the same issue about external validity applies here. They've discovered that uh, a bacteria responds in a certain way to a chemical in a test tube. Does that mean that that bacteria in your gut will respond uh, to that chemical in the same way? We don't know because we have not included that in the experiment. It's an issue of external validity. So are we going to see this in psychology? Uh, yes and no. 
uh, some areas of psychology uh, are focused on using in vitro studies. Uh, you know, uh, I reviewed one study done by a student that did look at uh, paramecium. And so all of his subjects were in a test tube. Uh, and of course, there are animal trials done. Uh, the more you get into uh, social psychology, the less you have, the less likelihood of running into animal trials or in, virtu in virtual studies. But you you may. Uh, but you know this also has the question about external validity. Can you generalize from a you know paramecium uh, to human beings, or do you even want to? Cross-sectional studies. Uh, this term in medicine applies to observational studies that just observe. So, uh, you know, your 330 text would call this natural ob naturalistic observation. Uh, that is, you would just look at, observe data from a population. Uh, a pretty, you know, uh, popular version of this in psychology would be the good old survey. That is, you survey people about something. Uh, that is a cross-sectional study. Uh, you could also, since we're talking about naturalistic observations, uh, the one-group observational study, uh, which psychologists would call that, that would be uh, the uh, uh, you know, cross-sectional study example. Case controlled studies. Uh, this means different things in psychology and medicine. Uh, and uh, generally it means that you're doing an experiment, but you have no randomization to groups. And so since you have no randomization to groups, you really shouldn't call it an experiment. It's really an observational study. Uh, it may be an observational study where you're looking at uh, different variables that could be called pseudo-independent variables. Uh, for example, you're looking at uh, helping behavior on the subway, and uh, a pseudo-independent variable would be the time of day. And so you're looking at different times of day, and you're looking at helping behaviors during a 15-minute period. Uh, that would be a, a case-controlled study. There's no randomization to groups, so uh, it's still just an observational study. Uh, another thing that may sound familiar to uh, students from 330 uh, is the, uh, you know, uh, the quasi, you know, quasi experiments where you have just an intervention group, where you just have one group and you intervene, and so you have a pre-intervention period where you measure the dependent variable you have the independent variable, uh, and then you have a post-intervention uh, period where you measure the uh, dependent variable again, and you compare the dependent variable from before to after, and you make a conclusion about the effect of the independent variable. You can do that, but it's not an experiment. That is, uh, you have no randomization, and there's a ton of uh, you know, threats to validity in those types of uh, experiments. And another example of case control, and this is the exact term that we would use in psychology, uh, is when the researcher creates a cr control group during uh, FIA matching. And so uh, in some experiments you run the experimental group and you create the control group not by randomly assigning people to the control or the experimental group, uh, in many cases you can't, so what you do is you create the control group by matching people with important uh, demographic variables or important other variables. Uh, an example, uh, here at York College, uh, student development did a really interesting study. They were interested in uh, proving that a three credit hour student development 101 is better than a two credit hour student development 101. So they ran a couple uh, semesters of three credit uh, SD 101s, and then they wanted a control group. Well, uh, 
to, to create a control group, what you had to do was randomly assign people to the control group. So that doesn't work. You know, like people signing up to take a three-hour, you know, uh, section of this, you can't say, oh, we're going to flip a, uh, a coin. If it comes up tails, you have to take a two-hour. You know, that doesn't work. So what they did is they worked through, looked through the two-hour, uh, you know, SD-101s, and they matched subjects or they match students from the two-hour SD-101 uh, based on important demographic variables. In this case, like high school GPA uh, was an important variable, maybe like York GPA after your first semester, something like that. The idea being they wanted to look at the effects of, you know, three uh, credit hours versus two credit hours uh, on people who are very similar and you couldn't randomly assign to get that similarity. Uh, cohort studies don't need to explain this. In research methods those are the longitudinal studies. And then finally the randomized control trials these are the experiments and they have the three major elements of an experiment. The groups formed via randomization. You have a in manipulated independent variable and you have control of conditions and similar conditions for the uh, experimental group and the control group except for the independent variable. And then finally uh, meta-analyses and a meta-analysis is a statistical analysis and that you know systematically examines the results of several research studies. Uh, you know, meta-analyses take advantage of the larger number of subjects from the combined studies, which gives the, uh, you know, analyses greater power. Uh, the errors associated with individual studies tend to cancel each other out as you throw different studies in together. Uh, and also, if you have a large number of studies with similar uh, methodologies or similar variables, uh, you can uh, add that into your meta-analysis, a meta-analysis, and you can identify patterns and make conclusions about those different methodologies or different uh, independent variables or dependent variables or whatever you're looking at. Uh, systematic reviews are doing half of what a meta-analysis do. Meta-analyses always start out with a systematic review. That is, you systematically go through the literature and you try to systematically find every study uh, that fits your criteria. That's what you start out with, with a meta-analysis. Then you get the data from those studies and start to analyze it statistically. A, statist a, sy uh, excuse me, a systematic review, you basically get the articles together, then you read them, and then you make some type of narrative conclusion about your judgment about these different articles. Uh, I think really you should have different levels here in that systematic reviews are really not as powerful or uh, do not have the strength of evidence as a meta-analysis. And eh, let's skip this interesting stuff. You could look, read it and uh, think about it. Just about uh, the good things about how uh, you, know, you know medicine has adopted uh, you know, evidence-based medicine and looking at meta-analyses uh, compared to what they used to do, uh, which was, you know, uh, kind of scary if you think about it, just, you know, what your doctor felt was a good idea. Uh, you know, they uh, did uh, do uh, randomized uh, experiments, so they did have good internal validity, but uh, beforehand medical science didn't really look at external validity that well. They didn't look at, you know, the effect of gender differences or the di differences between ethnic groups or genetic groups or racial groups. Uh, so, in general, it's a good thing they've, uh, you know, adopted the, uh, an evidence-based approach. And this is the full slide that I took from that website. Uh, and it's talking about how you know, things such as YouTube videos, personal anecdotes, uh, some guy on the on YouTube talking about something is not scientific evidence. And, you know, if we think about it with the coronavirus, a lot of people are on YouTube talking about different crazy ideas. 
but then we can also look at different levels of scientific evidence about COVID-19 and we should be focusing more on the higher levels of scientific evidence about uh, you know COVID uh, than the lower levels or some guy on YouTube. Okay, so that's a walkthrough of the different levels of scientific evidence. See you in lab.